good morning. I'm going to make a full quarter pound breakfast sandwich this morning. It's not going to be one of those little wimpy things like you get at the drive up window where it costs a dollar and three bites and it's gone. It's going to be a sandwich that's a, a good breakfast. Uh, McDonald's was like uh, the rest of the burger places, they made these little wimpy hamburgers. There's about four bites in them and they were all exactly alike and then in 1971 they came out with <clears throat> the quarter pounder and immediately their burger sales took off and they went through the roof at that point. Just proved that people were willing to pay for quality and, and quantity that they really wanted. Uh, so I'm going to do that this morning with the uh, breakfast sandwich. I'm going to start out with a full four inch burger bun here and not the little slider bun they call them or brioche bun or whatever it is that they normally make breakfast sandwiches with. And I'm going to use a full two ounce uh, sausage patty here. It was two ounces before it was pre-cooked but uh, after pre-cooking it's down a few grams but not much. It's still uh, two ounces of, uh, of sausage. Put that on the skillet there to start getting hot. Okay, the sausage is hot. It's hot. So I'm going to take it up now and cook my egg. And I like mine. Made Tex Mex style. That's with some crumbled corn chips cooked under it. This is called migas, which is in Spanish means crumbs. And that just adds a little bit to it. Now this is a large egg here, which weighs, has to weigh two ounces to be sold as a large egg. Just the egg and the sausage patty at two ounces each gets your quarter pound here. And that's not all of it by any means. Tilt it to where the egg runs out over the edge of the chips there all the way around. And my old ice cube trick, throw in an ice cube and put a lid on it and let it cook. And while the egg is cooking, I'm going to fix my bun, which is actually toasted here, instead of just a cold bun. And I'm going to put some spicy ranch dressing on there. Now, this originally was from Hidden Valley. When it got empty, I after, after having tasted it, I knew how it was made, so I refilled it with my own making. That's an equal part of mayonnaise and ketchup and half as much as either of those in the coffee sauce and just shake it up. And it makes a nice spicy, creamy dressing. I'll put the sausage patty on first. And this is a full one ounce slice of Colby Jack cheese. My Actually my favorite is smoked Gouda, but Walmart doesn't carry it anymore for some reason. Kroger does, but I, it's such a bother to go across the street and through all the shopping and everything to 
change it so I just use the Colby Jack cheese. But above all, don't use that American slices or any of that fake cheese. If you don't believe it's fake, just read the list of ingredients that are used to make it. Check the egg. Yeah, it's done. Take the ring off. A little salt. And some fresh ground black pepper. Show you the back of the egg here. Now that's not brown egg, that's just the uh, crushed corn chips on there. And this is just like the rest of the egg there. It also keeps it from browning on the bottom. Put it on here. And it's off to the table with that. And there it is on the table. Let's see how the sandwich tastes this morning. That is one good sandwich. Total weight about five ounces, a little bit better when you count the bun. And it's roughly the same thing you'd get in a one egg breakfast with sausage at IHOP or anywhere else. And the total cost on this is less than a dollar. Uh, Certainly not as much as it would cost us seven or eight dollars in a restaurant, plus another three dollars for a cup of coffee. You know, with this epidemic that we have going now, restaurants are going to suffer for a long time after this. Reed and I just got to talking that normally. We ate out at a restaurant a couple of times a week, and <clears throat> then every week or two I'd go meet with a friend of mine and we'd have breakfast. But two months have gone by and we haven't been out of the house to breakfast since then. <clears throat> and uh, when it opens up, I doubt if we'll start again, because people are creatures of habit. You create a habit, you tend to uh, repeat it. And uh, our habit now is not to go to a restaurant, so it's not going to be any loss to us to feel that we don't get to go to a restaurant. I feel sorry for them, but uh, uh, it's just one of the facts of life, and some businesses survive, others don't. But now I want to tell you the story about the uh, chuck wagon. <clears throat> Back in the mid-1800s, there was thousands of wild, wild cattle running in west central Texas. They call that west of the Brazos down there. <clears throat> and those cattle were longhorn cattle and hardy cows and they could eat anything and uh, they could fight off coyotes, bears even, that they had down there. And they were pretty t tough animals, except the younger ones were really tender and good steaks. And uh, the locals down there would hunt them just like uh, for food like they do with deer now. But the real demand for the steaks was in Kansas City and New York and back in there. 
and the only problem was the 500 miles between where the cattle were and a railhead where they could be moved back to the slaughterhouses in the east. So a fellow by the name of Charlie Goodnight was a young cowboy and he got a job with a, uh, uh, a cattle herd one time that they were going to move from central Texas to the closest railhead at the time which was Cheyenne, Wyoming. And uh, he had been over that country some so he knew it and uh, so he led them over into New Mexico which was a territory at the time. And up that way, and uh, they found enough uh, streams where to get water and everything like that. But it was kind of tough going, especially trying to feed the cowboys that went along on the on the trip. So when they got back, he got to thinking about it: How can I come up with some way to feed those cowboys? And the idea was a chuck wagon. So he bought an army surplus. Studebaker wagon is known as the best wagon built in those days and then set out to convert it over for a cook wagon or chuck wagon and he contracted with a furniture builder to build the cabinet that goes on there and he designed it and <coughs> uh, to where it would just slip right into the back of the wagon it uh, stood high enough off the floor of the wagon where they could put uh, cast iron uh, cookware under it. And then he put in drawers and compartments to hold things like rice and beans and flour and cornmeal and sugar and salt and all that. and. Uh, one of the little in innovations he came up with is so the drawers wouldn't slide out while it was shaking along on the trail and he notched down to the bottom of the drawer right at the face of it so when it went in it dropped down about a quarter inch and wouldn't come out open. And that exact system is used on modern day RVs and food trucks. And his wagons were such a success that he quit driving cattle and started building chuck wagons. And it's estimated that he built 35 of them in probably five years. And <clears throat> there's maybe half of those still exist, either in museums or in private hands. And uh, uh, I had a chance to spent a week at the uh, Western Artists Reunion, or camp out rather, out in New Mexico, and they hired a fellow from Channing, Texas, to bring his chuck wagon over there that his grandfather had been the cook on, on cattle trails. And he brought it over there and cooked for us for a week, and some of these pictures are a bit, some of them are other things, and uh, the, oh yeah, <clears throat> forgot to say, there was a door that closed up over the front of all those drawers and everything like that. That would let down with a leg under it to form the cooking surface where you're the work surface for the cook to work on. The first thing the cook would do when he woke up in the morning is build a fire and put a couple pots on there, one with chunks of beef in them, in it, and water, and to start in cooking, and the other was beans and water to heat up to start cooking there. And a coffee pot. And then he would start working on breakfast. Breakfast was usually strips of, of beef cooked with onions, maybe potatoes if he had them handy, and uh, that's what they had for breakfast, that and biscuits. And 
closest thing to it now we have is fajitas. And uh, then when it's time to break camp, he would, they would move the uh, uh, pots into the back of the wagon against the back of that cabinet and cover them to where they could keep them as warm as possible as long as they could. And then all the cowboys would throw their bedrolls in on top of them. And the chuck wagon was the first thing to leave. And the night before, the uh, cook had gone out and found the North Star and swung the tongue of the wagon to where it pointed at the North Star so he'd have a direction to leave the next morning heading out on the trail to where the trail boss could follow his tracks and he would uh, lead the, uh, uh, the drive for oh, 15 to 30 miles depending on the terrain and things like that to the nearest water so for a place to pitch for the night and uh, he, he was the navigator for them and it only took about one cowboy for every hundred cows well I hope you've enjoyed my story as well as I've enjoyed my breakfast and uh, my photos, uh, most of the photos in there are mine, there's a few that I found elsewhere. And uh, <clears throat> so God bless America, God bless Texas, and you folks have a great day.